Amy Gillespie for their energetic and comprehensive program of work in schools, communities, and in patient groups. So we're going to hear a few words from Jess and Amy about these activities. So I'd like to give my warmest congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. 
So from the Dove Festival, we went to the Headington Festival. Um, very similar in many ways, but I'll just touch a little bit more on the balloons and the tasks that we used. So you'll hear more about all that later in the cast talk. Um, but this was kind of a light, engaging way to get people talking about the kind of research that we do. So we are looking at digital expressions because that's a really key bit of emotional information that we make decisions about every day. And we decided to get these um, balloons and facial expressions and depending on their age of the child, how shy the child was, <laughs> ask them to do different things. So either describe the emotion of the face on the balloon or mimic the facial expression on the balloon. And you can adjust it for different age ranges. Um, this kind of drew in the children, and then when the parents were over, then you could talk more about the research and start a conversation. So that's quite a nice way to do that. One key thing I learned was that over four hours on a sunny day, 100 balloons were not enough in the slightest. So don't make sure you have a lot of balloons because it's really good. Really <laughs> and the last I just touched on some of the patient work that we've been doing. This has mainly been through the PAR group, um, which is run through the VRC, so it's a patient active in research group. And I was one of the first researchers to go and give an in-depth talk on one of the research studies in the department to this group. I think we had like an hour and a half shot, but it was not enough. <laughs> they were very, very engaged, really interested in learning all about the study. Um, and it taught me a lot about how important kind of transparency was to the public transportation specifically, and informed how I interact with participants and interact with social media and talking about study now. And another key thing that kind of learned from that is that a lot of patients feel that they kind of contribute to research and never hear back afterwards. So become a member of the PAR group and now kind of running part of the agenda is feeding back on the impact that their contribution to um, research and PPI has had on studies in the department. And we've involved a few other different things through the PAR group, so talking at an open day at open to the public about different research going on, and a little segment on um, training and PPI for the experimental medicine course that started this January. So I'll wrap up now, just to say thank you to the department for the prize, and thank you to all the various people that have been involved with all the work that we've done in our team of engagement. Thank you. John's um, uh, leadership, one of the major um, facets of John's leadership in the department. But today, this morning, we're going to hear about the middle bit. Um, and that's, that was the, under the leadership of Guy when the complexion of the department really changed. And Guy was really instrumental in bringing in hardcore neuroscience into psychiatry. Um, so Guy is a biological psychiatrist. And this morning, we're going to hear from Guy and Emily and um, Phil about some of their history of uh, psychopharmacology and the, uh, the influence that guys had on this field. And then later this morning, we're going to hear um, about some of the sort of new and exciting neuroscience that's being uh, developed uh, and implemented in the department today. So just before I hand over, I wanted to say something about the very important role that Guy has in changing the complexion of the department, and particularly in relation to the neuroscience, but also in terms of the, uh, diversity. So part of Guy's sort of mission to bring neuroscience to the department meant bringing in non-clinical academics, really for the first time, I think. Um, and those, uh, many of them happened to be female. So under Guy's leadership, the first female professors uh, were anointed. Um, uh, Emily had the very first PI in maternity leave in the department. These things all feel like they're commonplace these days, but it's only 10 years ago that this was new. Um, Guy also oversaw the building of an imaging facility on the Waterford site and, and, um, uh, and then uh, later put Kia Nobre as the director of that. So again, changing the complexion and really cementing the relationship <coughs> between psychiatry and our sort of sister departments of experimental psychology and uh, NECM. So, uh, of course, we're now used to seeing senior clinical, non-clinical uh, non academics around the department, but really this wasn't the case as Guy started. So I'm going to hand over to Guy now, but just before I do, can I just remind anybody who's interested in tweeting that there is a hashtag for the event, which is hashtag Oxsite50, 
if you can't remember what that is, and you are a Twitter, just go to the Oxford Poetry um, Twitter feed and you'll see it all over the place there. So thank you very much. Go. Well, thanks, Claire. That's a really very generous introduction, and uh, let's hope it uh, develops from here. So, I thought I'd find my slide. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, amazing <laughs> uh, so, so, I start with why we're supposed to do with disclosure. So, I just want to notice that I, uh, in my preparation for senescence, what I mainly do is to consult with Medicaid crush companies. So one of them is Campus Pathways, and some of what I'm going to say is slightly relevant to what they do. So my, my brief was to tell the story of the man of experimental medicine in Oxford psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And um, the more I thought about that, the, the words of Mark Twain came to mind, which is, the older I get, the more vivid is my own profession. <laughs> <laughs> and so <clears throat> I thought I would leave that, because Phil Cowan is the master of that kind of recollection. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would probably leave the real nitty gritty to him. Uh, and I was trying to concentrate on what Claire's been alluding to, which is this issue of how we bring neuroscience to the service of psychiatry, which seemed to me for many years to be a key <coughs> to real progress in, in our field, and particularly in the treatment of severe mental illness. So what I'm going to do is to talk about those developments a bit uh, in neuroscience generally, which many of these things will be familiar to you, but I kind of want to put them in the context of what it meant to psychiatry as a speaking of a psychiatrist. Um, talk a little bit about the, the emergence of monoamic biology, serotonin, vitamins, more adrenaline, and think of them as mechanisms for understanding brain and behavior, which I think is not commonplace, but which would have seemed uh, impossible 50, 50 years, 50 more years ago. And finally, to emphasize the centrality of the scientific method, um, which is not always taken for granted in our field, and which I think needs to be re-emphasized as the source of real progress in, in, in the world. In fact. So those are my objectives. I want to kind of wind back to about 1940, rather arbitrarily, 80, is that 80 years ago? No, it's a little more than that. Um, so what, what we're talking about there is uh, what we knew about the brain in psychiatry. And what we knew was that by and large, severe mental illnesses uh, ran in families, and that when you did twin studies, there was pretty good evidence that they were genetically uh, they were genetic, genetically predisposed. That evidence was always somewhat under threat because it originated in the rather gloomy era of uh, eugenics and particularly of uh, Nazi eugenics. So it was, it had a tainted history, but it just goes to show that you may be an evil bastard, but you can still get the right answer from your side. So it turns out that it's true that uh, our <laughs> sense of the mental illnesses have a genetic basis, and that at the time, since the brain is the organ of the mind, was the only way one could understand the brain's involvement. Finally, and secondly, psychiatrists looked at their patients and they saw abnormal phenomena. And they made qualitative distinctions from what they regarded as normal, everyday phenomena, in particular in regard to uh, primary delusions and some hallucinations. And they also noted, because in fact at the time, there was a good deal of overlap in the, the mission of the psychiatrists, the overlap with organic mental space, where there was clearly infection or lesions of the nervous system which gave rise to rather similar symptoms. So people could develop a belief in the association between psychiatric phenomenology and brain, but it was extremely imperfectly understood. And finally, there were kind of those pathology, and there was two sorts of pathology, there were, there were lesions that were made in animals or observed in man. And in 1939, Kluver and Lucy had described the syndrome that you got when you bilaterally took out the temporal lobes in animals, and they, they related that to abnormal mental states because the animals were behaved uh, abnormally uh, in terms of their aggressivity and their emotional responsiveness. So those are pretty basic, and the pathology of the conditions which Craven had expected to find had never materialized, so it was graveyard in two senses. Clearly, the pathology was done before the graveyard, but the study of the pathology of particularly schizophrenia was sometimes called the graveyard of pathologists because we didn't find abnormal cells and we didn't find abnormal protein in most of the conditions of the study. And then finally, you could notice that drug addiction argues for an effect of chemicals on the brain which produce symptoms of the core mental illness and therefore there kind of had to be a brain basis. So this is the kind of extremely patchy understanding we had uh, in those days of the relationship between the two. Um, what happened, I think, which was crucial, was that in 1943, there was the accidental discovery of LSD. 
Um, Albert Hoffman was the chemist that he worked for Sandoz, and he synthesized LSD several years previously. And he returned to it kind of by chance because he was curious about it. I think because of its structure as much as anything else, because he was a chemist who liked the greens. Um, and he knew that it was uh, related to, um, uh, to the ergot family of compounds, because that's where uh, the original the sort of basic structure comes from. And on that day, he took a dose of it, which was pretty standard in those days for drug development. In other words, the people who worked in drug companies were the first people to try the drugs. That was pretty standard practice. And on this occasion, he took what he regarded as quite a small dose, and he had a very exciting day. <laughs> uh, and it's described as the bicycle day because he attempted to cycle home. Uh, and he did get there, but he got there along with a whole lot of experiences for which he was completely unprepared. And can you imagine what this was like? Uh, and so what he described was, began to enjoy unprecedented colors and flavors of shapes, just to see the unclosed eyes, fantastic images. So you're all kind of familiar with the psychedelic experience, but this was a guy experiencing it in a purely Western setting as a result of taking the chemical he synthesized himself. And this had, this had a big impact, and it had big implications, uh, which not all of them were realized at the time, but all of which have been realized since. And the first one, it argued that chemical transmission in the brain would be the rule. And at the time, that was actually controversial. It was believed that most neurotransmission in the brain was electrical. Uh, and this was a, a big dispute between a guy called Jack Eccles and various pharmacologists who emphasized the possibility of chemical neurotransmission. And this, this issue got sorted out by Eccles and Katz uh, working in New Zealand between 1945 and 1950. And they worked on both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And basically, Eccles discovered that he'd been wrong all along. And uh, he's a wonderful example, actually, of a scientist who got it all wrong and then was able to prove that he was wrong and turn it around and prove how right he could be <laughs> by heart. So it's a great example. And he, these, these findings were really fundamental. And I take as evidence the fact that he got the Nobel Prizes uh, for medicine in 1963 and 1970. So Nobel Prizes, of course, are complete. What they emphasize is just simply how important these findings are. And so chemical neurotransmission was discovered by these guys, but it was actually, you could have deduced from the effects of LSD, because the effects of LSD were so profound, they were so widespread in terms of the higher nervous function of the people who took it, and the doses were so low that the transmission kind of had to be a synapses. So it's, it's just an example, I think, of, of where inspiration comes from, but it wasn't the key finding. But it was regarded as a sort of royal road to the unconscious. So the first thing that, that happened was that um, Sandoz made this drug available. So this is 1947, and LSD was suggested for psychiatric indications. Now, people had no idea quite what indication they were suggesting and how it would be used. <laughs> and there was kind of no regulation and no, uh, no pl and, and clinical testing before the drug was released. So isn't that's paradise for a <laughs> <laughs> So this was 1947. I mean, there had been previous minority. If you searched in the literature, you could find a minority interest in plant-based hallucinogens, which had obviously always been there, um, and also went into indigenous culture, etc. Et so that, that interest came later. But this was a narrowly medical <coughs> uh, availability, and it was really surprisingly widely available. And the question was, well, what, what, how should we think about this drug? Is it a, a model of psychopathology? You know, are people literally schizophrenic after they've taken this? And it didn't take very long for people to observe through their own experience and also experiencing looking at other people, but it didn't look at all like schizophrenia, it didn't look like mania. So it was something else. It, it wasn't really a model for psychopathology, although people clearly thought that the disturbance in, in function could be a clue to the, what you saw, so to speak, in the natural world. The second thing was the idea that it might be psycholytic in some sense. It, <coughs> it formed a break in people's experience, which was a therapy. And that idea kind of gained ground. And then finally, there was the idea that somehow it was there to assist psychotherapy. And that was the way in which people started to use the drug in the 1950s. The second <coughs> setting seemed to be crucial. So you needed to look after people, be with them, take them through the experience. So the sort of folk uh, psychology grew up around how to use the drug in psychotherapy. All of this was uh, not badly documented, in fact. There's a good book by Michael Holland, which was published last year, 
um, which sort of surveys this and describes it, and also <coughs> describes his own personal experience of taking these drugs, which is really interesting. Um, but this was resulted in 40,000 patients at least being treated, and the indication that it sort of converged on was alcoholism, terminal illness, and possibly anxiety and depression. So there was the beginnings of a set of indications, but it wasn't very easy to read that literature post-1980 DSM-4. People thought very much in terms of mechanisms rather than syndromes, and those mechanisms we would now regard as somewhat fanciful based largely on psychoanalytical theory. But there was certainly an attempt by the medical establishment to try and get hold of what this did and what it would be useful for. And for example, in the NHS, there was a guy called Ronald Sanderson, again, magnificently free to do what he wanted. He moved to a hospital in Worcester, which is a neglected psychiatric, a psychiatric hospital, a thousand beds. He and, and, and one other person looked after all these patients. And he'd gone on to some junket to Switzerland and met Hoffman, who obviously developed the drug. And Hoffman gave him some LSD to take back on the plane. <laughs> um, he also took him out to dinner and he had all sorts of nice food. I didn't realize actually that Switzerland lived the high life all through the Second World War. And these four guys in, living in England in 1950 were sort of still on rations. So it was, it was quite, a, quite a treat to get to Switzerland in those days. And there were 683 patients he, he personally entered into treatment, so 13,000 sessions. So again, you can see this is assisted psychotherapy. People are, are getting a mean of 20 per patient. And this went on for about, as you can see, six years until he left the hospital. And there were other examples in provincial centers that did the same thing. So there was an attempt to, to use this in the NHS. So there was real innovation. The buildings were quite rather less innovative. You can sort of recognize the, the style, which is the, the way they used to do things then. And uh, the sort of culture was a little different in that if you go to a psychiatric ward now, you don't quite see this level of um, <laughs> order and uh, dress. <laughs> but there they were. they were. They were truly innovating. And Sanderson wrote this up in considerable detail, very openly. Uh, this was published, but very much seen through the, 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 the lens of someone who was an analyst. So he very much saw this as opening the unconscious, and used, he used this to try and offer interpretations to patients and help them. And he kind of ignored what the diagnoses were, which is, is hard for us to say. Now, there's not a particularly happy ending to this, but I encourage you to read it, because in 2002, uh, the patients from this hospital got together with some uh, active lawyers, and they sued the NHS. And uh, because, but quite what the grounds are, I'm not sure, because this gives an account and it says the legal cost of proceeding to trial alone could have exceeded three million with the trial continuing for around six months. No admission of liability has been made and the settlement was motivated by a desire on behalf of this authority to limit the continuing accrual of legal costs, which I read to mean that the lawyers stood to get a lot more out of this than the patients. But the patients <coughs> got something out of it in the end and some of them were very delighted because I guess they'd been reimbursed about 4,000 pounds for 20 doses of LSD that some people would have to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. I mean, I think it's, it's an illust in, interesting illustration of what had happened in the meantime to the reputation of this treatment and the approach, this approach, which was well intended and I think potentially, and, and Sanderson maintained, was by and large well appreciated by most of the patients who got So what had gone wrong? Well, basically, it had been seen as an alternative, a route to an alternative consciousness. And I guess this is kind of where psychiatry can always run up against problems. And it was an answer, really, a call for spirituality without religion, which I think is pretty common now. It's sort of David Beckham style. Um, and personally, I, 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 my own preference, actually, is religion without spirituality, but I, I guess I'm sort of slightly out of the picture with the modern world from that point of view. But it's, it was related to the use, particularly by indigenous cultures, of drugs like mescaline. Mescaline was derived, in fact, from pay of cactus and used in South America. And there was a growing kind of an interest in this. And Aldous Huxley was, I'm sure you know, was a, a major uh, English intellectual critic and writer. And he was very interested in uh, the mystical traditions of the East and also of these drug-induced experiences, which he saw as, as, as kind of allowing access to uh, a heightened spirituality, a heightened mystical experience. So in 1954, he, he was actually supplied uh, a drug uh, a, a dose of mescaline by a guy called Humphrey Osmond. And he, Humphrey Osmond was Humphrey an English psychiatrist who worked in Canada. And there were centers of interest all over the world 
in the use of psychedelics in psychiatry. And Osman wanted an articulate guinea pig, as he put it. So he gave all the substances that, and as he said, he was almost the most articulate guinea pig you could hope to engage, because his account of his experience on methadone is, is a highly readable. I do recommend it to you. It's very, very interesting. And he described particularly the connectedness that people get with higher doses of both this drug and psilocybin, which makes them feel that the universe, in a sense, is, belongs to them, they're part of it, their sense of self dissolves, and we'll get something that is also described by people who are deeply into meditation, etc., etc. So you kind of know this. It became, this became, in the 1960s, as I was growing up, uh, this became a big deal. Everyone wanted to know about this. If you were intellectual, you definitely needed to take these drugs, and of course, people prescribed it. And one of the more amusing, I think, Phil actually drew my, drew my attention to this, but Arnie Lang was a sort of trendy psychiatrist at the time, and he was treating celebrity patients, and they would all be given LSD. And Edna O'Brien was a wonderful Irish writer at the time. She was sort of very beautiful, very talented. She was on television all the time, at least that's my memory of it. And she took LSD, and you see, she, she had very strange experiences, which highlight the potential dangers when, as I think is true, Lang paid little attention to set or to setting. He, he, he kind of thought the worst trip you had probably the better, I think. Yeah. But anyway, there we were. He was, trans he was transformed into a rat and her kitchen walls into flesh. I can kind of imagine the kitchen walls into flesh. And I, I was having trouble with the other image until I actually saw this picture. <laughs> and uh, you began to see exactly where that image arose from. There's really no difficulty. Um, but Lang is not really the story. Lang wasn't a big uh, issue as far as this is concerned. There were much bigger issues. And this guy is the main villain and Timothy Leary. He was a Harvard psychologist and he got he got LSD in the same way as everybody else. He promised to do research on it and he did some quite interesting stuff on set and setting. But he decided that this was this was something everyone should do and we should really change society. We should tune in, turn on and drop out. And this was a time when there was tremendous tensions in the United States over the Vietnam War. And those of you when alive then, I don't think we quite appreciate just how much that tore the country apart. And the echoes of that are still rumbling on in the United States between the people who were in favor and the people who against. And this was seen as a revolutionary threat uh, that people needed to be, the social control needed to be reestablished. And LSD was identified as part of a moral panic about the youth of the country. And so we got to this gentleman who he used to have a reputation of the biggest liar ever to be president of the United States. But sadly, he's lost that. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is Richard Nixon, uh, obviously enjoying himself. I don't know who this guy is. This is John Mitchell, obviously very happy. Uh, but the smile was wiped off his face when he went to jail after the water broke in <laughs> So there we are. So what were they signing? Well, they were signing the Controlled Substance Act in 1970, and they were making and elevating uh, these hallucinogens to the highest level of dangerous drugs, and because the USA, in a sense, controls <coughs> the international treaties around drugs, everyone else followed. And so a complete, if you like, on human experimentation, a, the whole chapter closed. So our, our, the diffusion into this public space, this involvement of political judgment about the value of this drug, completely destroyed the ability of scientists to work on it in that. And that was true for 40 years, two generations of scientists. So we're now returning to be able to use it, and the big challenge is whether we can, whether we should, whether we will remedicalize the drug with clear indications that are based on more conventional views of psychopathology. And it's an interesting thing for the future. Now, quite apart from its history in man, the drug had a major impact on psychopharmacology. It made psychopharmacology possible, and it hadn't really been before. Um, and the reason is quite simple, that it was, if you see the structure here, it's very similar to an endogenous chemical serotonin, or 5-HT, which is shown on the left. So the similarity is, is obvious. You can think of these molecules as, as little keys fitting locks, which are the receptors, and you can see that this would give you a drug which would, would probably work at serotonin receptors. So that's a little, that's jumping the story. But the story is an interesting one, and this is told by uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Richard Green, who both Phil and I work with, for a number of years, and he reviewed this, and it's, again, well worth reading, you're at all interested in this, um, and he, he reviewed it from a, a UK perspective, but you have to bear in mind that this was, there was international interest, so there was, there was the NIMH had major labs working on this, there were also labs in Canada, there were also labs in Europe, so there was a, 
general, general interest in this, these new brain chemicals, as it were. And over the subsequent years, we got the observation that 5-HT was, was, and serotonin were the same as entropy, which was already described as an extract in the gut. But this occurred in the brain, but the interactions, as predicted by the structures, took place in both the gut and the brain. And the monoamine oxidation was involved in the breakdown of 5-HT, <coughs> etc., etc. So we got the pharmacology of this neurotransmitter worked out in tremendous detail, and we got innovation around antidepressants, SSRIs, and also an understanding, to some extent, of one of the actions of lithium. So we, we got an explosion of information over the next uh, 20, 30 years. And the people involved are some of them associated with Oxford. So Hugh Blaschko taught pharmacology in Oxford. Um, David Graham Smith was head of the clinical, uh, the MRC clinical pharmacology unit, uh, and Alec Coppen actually was the person who didn't get the chair of psychiatry when Michael Gelder did. So things might have been a little different if, if he'd got it. Um, but actually, to be honest, with all this fashion, I think they made the right choice in 1969. So these were these were people who all had links to to Oxford, and they they formed the UK cohort of people who contributed to this this science. Um, the importance of it in terms of international profile is emphasized by, by the, the Nobel Prize, which was awarded to Von Euler, but worked, he worked in Sweden, obviously, and worked on the, um, the way in which you could identify these monoamine pathways in the brain. Julie Axelrod, who worked on mechanisms of, of all of the, the 5 HD metabolism and reuptake. Arvid Carlson, Paul Greenwell. And Eric Kandel actually didn't work on it, but he did have the distinction of being a psychiatrist who gave up because he couldn't see any way in which he could make sense of, uh, of the biology of the, of the psychosis that he saw. So the story so far, the story to this day, uh, is across species, monoamine to modulate brain networks. We know that they're involved pretty critically in normal anxiety, error detection, reward, decision-making, effort, emotional memory. And these networks clearly support all the phenomena that are associated with psychiatric disorder. So we're at a point, I think, where we're in a completely different place from where we were 80 years ago. We understand a great deal more about how we might think about the underpinning of psychiatric disorders. And the challenge for you guys is to deliver the goods in terms of making that neuroscience base something real for patients with mental illnesses. So we've got to see convergence, I think. We've got to see convergence between what I call learning therapies, as we described yesterday, medications, possibly psychedelics if they have a place, and neurostimulation. We've got to understand how they work together and how they work separately. And to do that, I think the challenges are to identify outstanding individuals. I really agree with uh, John uh, Williams yesterday. Uh, and I think we're quite good at that at doing here. I do a bit of that, good at doing that here. You've got to have a supportive environment that kind of works for everybody. Uh, you've got to have proportionate regulation. I think, sadly, although it's very easy to see that the lack of regulation before 1962 was a bit of a disaster, it did give fantastic freedom to innovate. And what we've got now is increasingly a crushing burden of trivial regulation that makes it very hard to do very simple things. And that, if that doesn't change, I think we will be completely overtaken by people working in China. So we've got to think about this in Europe extremely carefully and also in the United States. We've got to have a free market and ideas. And I think I recommend that you always ask with Karl Popper, how might I falsify this claim? And I would ask that of everybody. I'd ask that of people who are the heads of your lab. I'd ask it of your colleagues. I'd ask it of your compulsory trainers. I'd ask it of um, Athena Swan. And I would particularly want you to ask it of yourself. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, the surprise on offer if you can name who this is and what they said, we will cover that in the discussion. Thank you very much. And in honor of Gary's source of retirement, sort of retirement. Thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> okay, that's a fantastic uh, history of the general area. And now we're going to move on to, um, I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Emily Holmes, who's a visiting professor uh, in the department. Um, and uh, I guess one of my compatriots in the era of, uh, of Guy's leadership. 
Um, and um, which one are you on this? Thank you very much, Claire. And, uh, I was intrigued to uh, hear Guy's talk. Thank you. Um, my talk's about uh, lab to clinic and back again. It's actually a tribute to Guy, because in characteristic style, Guy talked about very interesting things, but very little about himself. So I get the honor of being able to do that a little bit. Um, and it's also fantastically nice to be back again. So thank you very much to John and Kat and Claire and others facilitating that. And a warm congratulations to Department of Psychiatry 50th birthday. Brilliant. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to give an inside out perspective because I have the great privilege of very uh, key part of the way I think as a clinical scientist, I owe to this department. Um, and I think once you've been here, you never really leave. I'm very honored to still be a visiting professor, um, both in person, but also in the way I think. And giving that inside out perspective, um, I hope this is a reflection both on what Guy's done, but also perhaps how the department's seen from the outside, at least internationally. My home base now is in Sweden. And my position is across the Karolinska, home of the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Um, and also at Sala, uh, a very old university, not unlike this one. So, from the outside, Oxford psychiatry is legendary. Um, you'll know that. And the leadership in Oxford is incredibly important in creating departments that we know and work in today. So, the respect that the department's held is also very much due to uh, the re uh, reflection of the respect in which Guy has seen, both as a scientist, as a clinician, as an academic leader, and of course as a football supporter of Manchester United. So you have this person here who's not only pioneered a lot of science and culture change himself in terms of the way we do mental health science, but very fundamentally created this sort of climate, if you're interested in connectivity in your talk, but this climate of connections between people who might be able to flourish. So I think a really important part in a connected view is doing things differently. And as John Williams also said yesterday, slow science is important, so taking a long view. So in one of the coffee breaks yesterday, one of somebody came up to me and said that they felt that they were 27 years old and maybe they hadn't made it yet because clearly that was what one was meant to do. And I don't really think the long view sustains that. Um, whatever impressions we make, brilliant discoveries, perhaps by some people early on, there is a long view, and science is slow. And proving that you're wrong as well as you're right is part of that. Um, but what John also said yesterday is now is on parallel time to make progress, and yes, we do need to do that in mental health. So the Oxford Psychiatry Department is known as one in which it's not only world leading, that you can focus on the right science questions regardless of the football team you support, as it were, scientifically. And I think that's quite a unique environment. And if you want a football team to work, I rubbish at football, but um, I understand it's got to be a certain amount of uh, skill, craftsmanship, but also, in guys' words, a bit of serious fun to get the whole thing on the road. Um, and a kind of classic guy question that I've been asked so many times is, have you thought about dot, dot, dot? Does that ring a bell? Yeah. yeah, okay. Now, the first time I was asked that, I was absolutely petrified. I was in Cambridge, I'd written a grant, that's what you're meant to do as a clinician scientist, to try and come to Oxford, um, being an undergraduate here, loved the science that's coming out of the department, really wanted to know more about it. Didn't have a clue about science careers. I got an interview, and as a prospective head of department, Guy said, why don't you come and do a mock interview? And I just had this frozen and I thought, gosh, how terrifying. So I wrote back and said, no, thank you. And, <laughs> and then he wrote again and he said, oh, why? And I said, well, uh, it's the most lame excuse in the world. It's very embarrassing. I said, I think, uh, as a PhD student, I'm very busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Um, and then the next email came back and it just said, fly. And I thought, huh? What? Um, you ha ha, I wrote back, and the guy wasn't joking at all. This wasn't the serious fun part. He actually then sent me a link to some private person who was doing a flight between Cambridge and Oxford at the time in half an hour. At this point, this is the best psychological treatment for social anxiety I'd ever had. And I realised if someone suggesting I was flying, what I really ought to do is get on that train and come for a mock interview. This mock interview, I met to people like John, like Paul, like Phil, we're here from later, and they all asked me in this particular Oxford way, I presented my, you know, embryonic ideas. Have you thought about? And so the conversation continued. And so the conversation has continued over the years in terms of provoking oneself to criticise one's work just as much as one occasionally makes a step forward. So back to Guy. <coughs> Sorry, Guy. Um, uh, Guy Manning Goodwin. Um, so Guy's background is actually a BA in animal physiology. Um, and a DPhil in neurophysiology, um, qualified as a psychiatrist, worked in Edinburgh, the MRC Brain Metabolism Unit, and returned to Oxford uh, in 1996, um, and led our department. And Guy has received numerous awards throughout his career, maybe receiving this one for your work in bipolar disorder. Um, and uh, as a fellow of all sorts of um, organisations, such as the Academy of Medical Sciences. And in his own works, I guess what we, we see at uh, uh, Sanctuary is his work in the treatment of bipolar disorder, and as Claire mentioned, bringing in neuroscience into understanding the neurobiology of mood disorders. Always with a focus, not just on asking interesting questions, but questions that can make a difference <coughs> to uh, patients, uh, families to recipients of this knowledge. And so Guy, in his leadership of the department, created this fantastic environment in which uh, uh, bringing into psychiatry the use of neuroimaging techniques, just as uh, with Claire, um, uh, in fMRI, in Meg, with Kian Obrey, and so on and so forth. But the world was not always thus. And actually, in the early years, uh, far from <coughs> neuroimaging, uh, Guy's first work was in actually the mechanisms of kinesthesia. Work which I understand in Cambridge is still being used as an undergraduate practical. And it's extremely highly cited. So we always check these things. Is it highly cited? Uh, yes, it remains. This body of work remains highly cited. But if you look at the x axis, uh, it's all right for 2018, but by the time it gets to 2020, it all drops off, Guy. But that's good <laughs> for you. <laughs> Um, so, the other thing I think about the slow science view is that it's not about one particular study, it's about bodies of studies, and I know that um, Phil will talk more about the serotonin story. Um, but what does that mean for not only scientists, but for uh, people who benefit from science? Well, it means all sorts of things. The impact of taking a voyage of discovery in science is that we may actually be able to screen for new compounds that would make a difference. Um, that we might be able to develop a theoretical mechanistic understanding um, exemplified in the work by Kath Harmer and colleagues in actually how biases may combine and be shifted pharmacologically uh, and cognitively. Again, how we can create treatments across modalities that can take the necessary step forwards that we need to make. And underlying that, also an interest in how we are actually carving up the world. Um, how do we uh, classify, as it were, what psychopathology or disease states so would look like? And of course, these basic science questions are also fundamental to the way we ask our future questions and pursue our research. But as well as bodies of work and lines of scientific inquiry, what characterizes Guy is an intention at both ends of extreme. Sorry, I can't speak. Okay. Um, so on one hand, I had the privilege of working with Guy in the Mood Disorders Clinic and seeing the exquisite attention to detail and effort and time put into running a clinic for people, not only these, who aren't part of researchers, but running a service for Oxford in people with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And right from the very first day of arriving here, how working with and discussing uh, ideas with recipients of those ideas is perhaps integral to what we do. 
And from that end of focusing on the individual and just um, the most clinical respect, um, um, going to the bit, bigger picture, so reviewing the whole field and thinking, how do we change um, and bring evidence-based practice into the profession? So working on reviews and guidelines to move things forward um, for the recipients of this kind of work. And so alongside that, and I think this has kind of been exemplified by Guy's talk on uh, LSD just now, a sort of completely unafraid to think about innovation. Um, and Guy has been a PI on both drug trials, psychoeducation trials, and one of the awards we've got from John Geddes on innovation itself. So here, putting into people's own hands a simple way of tracking their mood, something that's valuable clinically and something that's essential scientifically in trying to have a target to tackle in drug discovery and other treatment discovery, mood instability. So that's a bridging picture. <laughs> So Guy talked about experimental medicine. This is what it says on the department website. Um, and it's just an extraordinary looking from the inside outside in the way that experimental medicine has uh, taken root um, in Oxford. And just a, a, a reflection of the groups that now identify as working to some extent within this framework is simply incredible and part of Guy's legacy. So from Mike Browning's work in computational psychiatry through to neurobiology of aging, through to psychopharmacology and emotional research, all of this work pertaining people with different football teams, sometimes coming working in the same football team, playing at home matches and away matches. Quite amazing. Um, and experimental medicine is critical and a huge part of Guy's legacy after the Gelder years, as it were. But I also wanted to, of course, mention the many other inspiring talks that we had yesterday, for example, in epidemiology and data science. So it goes beyond even uh, the boundaries of experimental medicine to many other areas that are important for a global approach to psychiatry today. And I think key to that is this climate that you talked about, actually, in the last slide. We didn't orchestrate talks. Uh, investing in early career researchers and being open to novelty. So even uh, open to crazy ideas coming in from psychologists who refuse to get on airplanes, like um, mental imagery, um, something we wrote in the American Journal. Um, what's mental imagery? So it's the experience of seeing the mind's eye, hearing with the mind's eye, so a form of perception in the absence of the percept. And it's incredibly interesting because it really is a little bit like, with the neuro, if you look at the neuroimaging literature, a bit like having um, weak perception. So, for example, if you, uh, how do you imagine Guy when he's not there? You just shut your eyes and imagine that for one second. Yeah, so that's an example of a mental image. So, if you open your eyes again, um, you might imagine him as the way he appears in the department portrait. Or you might have imagined him in one of those many conversations. Um, or perhaps you imagined him as you just saw him just now, talking on the stage. My mental image of guy is mostly like this one with the raised eyebrow thing. Actually, John does that too, with the raised eyebrow thing. But anyway, it's the, have you thought about? <laughs> question just about to happen. Um, and this reminds me of another thing. If you pull not just architects of football teams, but actually the physical environment, how do we get these conversations happening? So another good to legacy was the lunch area. Which I'm sure all of you, well, I hope all of you have time for lunch. I don't think it was just about eating lunch. I think this area in the middle was really more about asking questions and discussion. And so this is a place where, which changed my career direction when Guy and John and visiting researchers, of which there are always many sponsors of psychiatry, started asking me whether we'd thought about bipolar disorder, which I hadn't very much into that point. Um, to keep taking up clinical work in the mood disorders clinic and bringing in mental imagery into that discussion. And my view on mental imagery from my lab work was that it could amplify our emotions. So what happened if we began to ask patients 
if they had it. Because obviously if we're doing an assessment for something like post-traumatic stress disorder, it's very usual that I'd ask if someone recalled events, could see them in their minds, I had intrusive memories. But this kind of way of thinking hadn't been taken so much of bipolar disorder. And what we discovered is we opened up and asked these questions, then people would describe them as both the stressful things that had happened in the past, but also, and we know mental imagery promotes time travel, things that happened in the future, um, so we call flash forwards, for example, that might occur in an episode of mania. And we could take these kind of uh, chemical and phenomenology examples and then try and model that under laboratory circumstances. So work with cohorts of young people, uh, high or low in bipolar type traits, and look at their ability um, to respond to a stressor and what happened. And we saw that those uh, who were more energetic and sociable, for example, high energy Q, went on to develop a greater number of intrusive images of the event that was presented to them. So we pinned, I pinned a fairly simple but very clear hypothesis, which that there is vivid and compelling mental imagery in bipolar, that we know that imagery can drive mood, both in a positive and negative direction, and therefore focusing on that imagery may be one piece in the puzzle towards helping improve instability uh, in mood, uh, which is something we need to do to improve these kinds of treatments. So taking the Oxford model that we heard about uh, yesterday, trying to pinpoint a target, try to just focus on that imagery <coughs> in particular, um, and noticing that we can all react as a continuum. Um, but for example, what would happen? This is a sort of sketch that you might work on in the clinical section. If you have suddenly a very positive uh, event, like you've got some good data, your actual experiment worked out, maybe you should write it up for a high profile journal. Gosh, if you have an image yet, you might see that journal vividly. Um, if you see the journal and you think, gosh, sure, this thing might go, where's this going to take me? Back to those things that you were just mentioning earlier. This is the Nobel Prize ceremony in Stockholm. If you're going to do something like that, being British and polite, one ought to probably be polite, speak to the king in the right language, so you should try and learn Swedish. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, so how one could, how one's images produce uh, clues to what one ought to do next and, and propel action? But this meant that we could work together with the Professoral Mood Disorders Clinic and think about how to perhaps slow down and work on taking out the emotional tone of such imagery in order to balance mood. I won't go into details, um, more than to say that um, it required thinking about the outcome and how to measure that as much as how to treat that and very slow, uh, specific, experimental and clinic work but with an overall aim to think about modulating uh, the kind of mood instability that I learned so much about from Guy and John, and working on ways of understanding that mathematically as well, as John talked about yesterday. Um, and now in Oxford, um, that work continues to go forward with a trial led by Craig Steele now at the um, Psychology Training Department. And as an experimentalist, Guy encouraged me all the way to write things up rather than to have the therapy as uh, unclear as to what was really going on. So one of the things I'm going to give you later, Guy, is the publishers just sent the first copy, for which you very kindly wrote actually a backward rather than a forward. Um, um, and so we have that there. And it's not a, a recipe of here, do this now. It's also a way of trying to make our, our techniques that we use in therapy open and transparent and re uh, replicable. So I hope that's an interesting science as well as clinical endeavour. Um, and to go with that book, you always tease me about when we were talking about all of this work, we were having lunch a lot, how awful the food was in Scandinavia, and I couldn't disagree more. So I bought you some special things. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find them later. But herring's delicious, right? Um, coming back to... Guy more broadly, from the inside out. Um, so, Guy was here. When he wasn't having lunch in the common room, he was getting on his bicycle and cycling down to Merton, um, where he was a fellow for many years, which is an indication of his service not only within the department, but the university more broadly. Um, I don't know how he sat on all those committees and did all of that. Actually, looking back, it's quite incredible. Um, 
And his service to the field was also beyond Oxford University, but to associations um, such as the BAP, um, to the NHS, to advisory boards, <coughs> and to the ECMP. And one of the highlights of his presidency for me at Roots was reading the regular blogs that came out, which were not only quite insightful, but at times hilariously funny. But his last blog actually picked up on the themes he ended up um, in his talk. Um, which is really to support the young researchers um, and kind of recognise it's not always easy and how we might facilitate and enable careers in mental health science. Um, and in fact, he used his presidential symposium to do just that and bring together a wide range of young scientists, again, to do another bridging thing and debate from uh, different perspectives, um, challenges going forward, which was really fantastic meeting. Um, and that led us to later, and our voice was here yesterday, also thinking about defining a common agenda, working with Kath Harmer, Paul and Johnny, who was in the department previously, or Shafran as well, on trying to uh, look at ways of bridging our interests in mental health science, rather than keeping them separate and different football teams, and by asking joint scientific questions very critically. How do our existing treatments work? We will need mechanisms to understand this. If we understand how they work, it's a window into how to scale them up. It's a window into how to make more happen more effectively. And to keep reviewing, criticizing, and generating our work, just as Guy Goodwin has himself explained earlier. Um, and I think science as a way, some treatment discovery is serendipitous, but science offers one way of taking us forward, and that's a bridge that also psychiatry has built. That football team was kept together by a certain amount of humour, which is why I like the raised eyebrow thing. It just captures you pretty well, Guy. Um, and so it's a real honour to stand here. It's lovely to be back in Oxford um, and absolutely brilliant to have so many discussions over the breaks. I can't wait to be looking at the 30 posters out there in a moment. Um, it's where the real action is happening. Um, I hope, Guy, I know, I know that uh, having nice things said to you isn't your favourite occupation, but I have to say that at a time like this. Um, how many of us held you, hold you, and continue to hold you in the greatest esteem as a scientist, as a clinician, and as an academic supporter of our field? And you, uh, I really never understand football, really. Um, and what a climate you did create and continue to create for others. As Eleanor so wisely said yesterday, this isn't really a retirement festival, it's a lifetime achievement award festival, these two days of Oxford Psychiatry. And it's about the long view. We need to make progress. We need to silence in that armory. Um, and the psychiatry department here is world leading on this very amazing ability to focus on the question and how to address it, rather than just simply getting uh, into football teams that are different. And creating in that this very important notion of serious fun to make sustainable careers. And the legacy, as John said yesterday, it's an unparalleled time to make progress, and that's such an exciting uh, mission to go about. So that famous expression, ever so politely, have you thought about, and the moment I arrived, I'd written this talk already, Guy said to me, have you thought about, um, long may that continue. Um, so thank you, thank you very much, especially to Guy Woodwin. And to finish up this first session of the day, we have Phil, Phil Cowan, who is going to tell us. Oh, I do the first slide. This looks sweet. Over to you, Phil. Thank you very much, Will I go back to slide learning mode? Um, and, um, just to say, my title is an interesting one for the past, present, and future of psychopharmacology. 
can tell from my appearance, I'm very well versed to talk about the past. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Guy's comment, though, Guy's warning, just thinking of the old Soviet saying, um, which was something along the lines that um, uh, the future is certain, it's the past that's always changing. Um, and, and so, um, I just like him, Guy has actually mentioned the person in the middle of this photograph, uh, wearing a false moustache here. Uh, this is David Graham Smith, who was the um, director of the MRC unit of um, clinical pharmacology at the Radcliffe Infirmary, um, based about 90 yards from where we are now. And David was important for, for the um, development of psychopharmacology in this department uh, for two main reasons. Firstly, he was an early advocate of translational neuroscience, taking findings from animal experimental studies through to human investigations. Second, uh, he, he trained many psychiatrists in psychopharmacology. And on the right is uh, one of the world's best known psychopharmacologists, Professor David Nutt, uh, who was a member of this department, now has the chair at Imperial. Uh, he also trained many other members of this department, um, including Guy Goodwin. Um, in 1973, Michael Gelder and David Graham Smith started a collaboration between their two departments, and that had an important influence on the research programs that were followed. David was an expert on the um, neurotransmitter mentioned by Guy, serotonin, 5-HT, it's the same thing. I'm afraid I, I tend to move between them without thinking. Uh, David's lab was also very interested in the mode of action of antidepressant drugs. I'm just going to say a word at the end about the possible role of repurposing um, in current drug discovery. Um, I think David Carr mentioned Michael Gelder was um, brilliant in grant writing applications. And, and he helped us to um, um, develop that skill as well. And, and that's led to this work being MRC funded um, since 1993. Uh, when I came to the department uh, in 1979, a Little More Hospital was still a functioning large psychiatric unit. Um, and um, Michael Gelder and Bertram Mandelboat had um, converted some unused patient space into a psychopharmacology lab. So here you see a lab um, based in what was the old um, patient dormitory. Um, here's a side room where you can um, carry out pharmacological testing. Um, there's a nurse's observation office next door. Just so I can point out um, there the uh, more relaxed attitude to information security in those days. <laughs> so to the younger members of the audience, I can say, this is a filing cabinet with a key in it. <laughs> we know. Um, after Guy, uh, uh, when, when Guy joined the department as the handy chair after Michael Gilder's retirement, um, Little More Hospital closed, and we were quite uncertain about where we might be able to work next. Uh, thanks to Guy's vision and robust negotiating skills, we were able to move into this lovely building on the Waterford site called the Neuroscience Building. Uh, one of my patients did say, though, that uh, it's a much nicer place, but it's still the same people looking after you. <laughs> um, in those days, we were studying 5-HT through what was called the neuroendocrine window. Uh, some of the older members of the audience might um, recall this, and this rests on the observation that 5 uh, HC neurons play an important role in the secretion of anterior pituitary hormones, um, in this case prolactin is mentioned. And so if you activate 5 HT neurons with a selective drug, there's an increase in plasma prolactin. The size of the increase tells you how well 5 HT pathways are, are working. Um, and here's this method in operation, so it's a study in depressed patients by Zubin Bhagwaga, and he's using the um, SSRI um, citalopram to activate 5-HT neurons. Um, on, on the left 
panel screen, you see there's a robust proactive response in um, uh, non depressive controls. But in two groups of depressed patients, you can see that the, the, uh, the, the response is markedly attenuated. Um, so these tests are simple and they're acceptable, but they're clearly quite indirect. And over the uh, next few years, we were able to use more advanced brain imaging techniques to try and assess 5-HT mechanisms directly in, in the human brain. Uh, much of this work was um, carried out in um, collaboration with the um, um, PEP facilities at Imperial College, and we are still working there, um, now, now collaborating with David Nutt. And so, if you want to measure 5-HT release in, in the human brain, uh, you need two things. You need a, a, a selective ligand which binds to 5-HT receptors, receptors, and a drug which can increase 5-HT release from presynaptic terminals and thereby displace the ligand. So on the left of the picture, uh, we're looking at the at the binding of a compound called SIMB36. This binds to the 5-HT2A receptor, um, which is the receptor activated by psilocybin to, to produce the kind of psychological effects experienced by Alpha Hoffman. Um, trying to displace SIMB36 with normal 5-HT agents is rather tricky, so the SSRIs don't seem to work very well. But David Nutt's group has shown that you can release it using amphetamine challenge. So we normally think of amphetamine as a noradrenaline and dopamine releaser, but it can also release 5-HT. And the next slide shows how it does that. So if you look at the lower panel, um, this is coded. So the brighter the yellow, the more simply binding. Uh, there's a baseline picture, which you, which you can see there. And then, um, post amphetamine challenge in a, a number of health, healthy male volunteers, I think you can just about discern that the um, <laughs> yellow colour is, is some, somewhat muted. Um, this is showing that a certain amount of simbi has been displaced by the 5-HT released by, by amphetamine, um, and it works out about 15%. And so this is a model of 5-HT, 5-HT release in, in, in the brain, and you can use that to study 5-HT release in patients with depression. Um, and this is work which is underway, so I'm just showing some um, preliminary data in a study that's uh, being, being conducted by um, um, Eata Golbuska. So um, um, along the vertical axis, uh, we have amounts of simply displaced, so the higher the um, percentage, uh, the more 5-HT has been, has been released uh, by, by amphetamine. If you look at the control group, each blob represents an individual, so most people have a certain amount of simply displacement. Um, if you look at the controls, the mean shown by the black bar seems to be less, so this is what we would predict people with depression have decreased brain 5-HT release. Uh, we also need to go on to try to confirm this, and then it will be of interest to study things such as, for example, does baseline 5-HT 5 5-HT 5 release correlate with improvement with 5-HT potentiating drugs, such, such as the SSRIs. Um, I'd just like to say um, something now about how do antidepressants work? Uh, because David Graham's this lab was very interested in that. Um, one question which a neurobiological approach has tried to understand is why is there a long delay in antidepressant drug action? So if patients take an antidepressant, it might take a number of weeks before we notice an appreciable clinical effect and they start to feel better. Uh, but of course the pharmacological action of the drug actually takes place very quickly. So if you give an SSRI, you'll block the reuptake of 5-HT probably after a few minutes. Why the long delay? And the usual idea has been that um, the, the acute pharmacological action triggers a series of neuroadaptive changes 
that slowly evolve over time. And it is these neuroadaptive changes that lead to the antidepressant effect. It's important to identify them because if we could, we might be able to make antidepressants that are faster acting and more effective. And so I just wanted to show this paper by Guy, published in Nature, because it's a very good example of this kind of work and it's been um, influential. And so Guy here was studying um, presynaptic serotonin receptors. I'm going to call them 5-HT autoreceptors. And they normally act to slow down to a strain 5-HT cell firing. Guy showed that um, over two to three weeks treat treatment in animals, these 5-HT autoreceptors become desensitized. This would be important because then 5-HT neurons would start to fire more and the effects of the SSRI to increase 5-HT neurotransmission would be amplified. This might correlate with the antidepressant effect. Uh, the other point about Guy's study here is that it's fairly translatable. So he's modeling 5-HT autoreceptor function by challenging the autoreceptors with a, with a specific drug and lowering body temperature, um, a so-called hypothermic response. And this is something which you can do in, in humans. And uh, here's a study by Peter Sargent. And if you just look at the right-hand panel, Peter's looking at people taking the SSRI peroxetine prior to treatment and after 17 days. So again, if you look at the right-hand panel, the temperature is down the vertical axis. The open squares is pre-treatment, and you can see a nice hypothermic response, a lowering temperature. Clearly after 17 days, it's been attenuated. So just as, as in animals, SSRI treatment in, in humans, after time, desensitizes 5-HC autoreceptors. And we carried out a number of studies along these lines and generally found that uh, the various neuroadaptive changes described in animals did occur in humans taking SSRIs. But we still felt it was hard to explain, hard to go from that to why does an antidepressant make you feel better if you're depressed? What's the psychological mechanism? And to understand that, we um, had to adopt a method from, from, from a rather different approach. Um, Emma has referred to this. Again, Guy play, played a key role. Um, he, he became in, interested in, in the role of facial expression recognition to probe emotional function um, in, in patients with mood disorders and to try and assess the underlying neural circuitry which supported emotional regulation. And the underlying <coughs> principle is that humans are hardwired across cultures to, to recognize a small number of basic facial and emotional expressions, and they're listed here. Um, having worked in um, uh, multidisciplinary teams for many years, I've become rather desensitized to negative facial expressions when I make a suggestion. Um, uh, but even I can tell we're not in a good situation here. Um, and um, obviously this is much better. Um, if, if you morph the faces, it becomes rather a harder task. So we're going here on the left from a neutral facial expression to happy at the far right. And if you just look towards the left-hand side, it's a difficult decision to say, what is this facial expression? When does it become happy? And we all vary a bit in how good we are at it. Um, it's important to note that patients with depression have a negative emotional bias. And this can be detected by this task in that they would have trouble detecting a happy facial expression to your right up the right-hand side. Conversely, the... Um, Negative emotional bias would mean if you show people with depression a sad face, a morphing of a sad face, they would be better than non-depressed controls at spotting when it was sad. And it's this negative emotional bias that's thought to um, um, perpetuate the <coughs> low mood in a kind of cognitive vicious cycle. Um, it was Catherine Harmer's observation that um, the effect of antidepressants 
is exerted principally not on mood, not emotional processing, which I think has led to a transformative understanding of how antidepressants work. And I think this was the first study where Catherine showed this kind of effect. So we're back again to our SSRI, IV citalopram, with healthy participants randomized in the dark circles <coughs> to either IV citalopram or in the open circles to IV saline control. And what we're looking at here is facial expression um, of um, happy faces. So this, this is immediately after the IV citalopram. There's no mood change, but you can clearly see, I think, that people are better at spotting happy facial expressions after the drug. They, 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 they've had a positive emotional bias. And Catherine has um, gone on to show this in several other models of emotional processing um, and, and uh, with a range of conventionally prescribed antidepressant drugs. Um, and it occurs in, in both healthy participants and in, and in, in depressed patients where it acts to, act to um, um, reverse the characteristic negative bias that, that depressed patients confer upon the world and upon themselves. Um, in, the, in depressed patients, at an individual level, the extent of the bias reversal um, predicts therapeutic response several weeks later, showing it is in fact an important mediating mechanism. So um, I think, uh, thanks to Kath, I think I now un understand how antidepressants work. Um, and this model, I think, um, tries, try, tries to illustrate that. So if, if we start with, with the SSRI, antidepressant drugs, I think, don't work slowly. They actually work very quickly. But they work to change emotional bias in a positive direction. So in a depressed patient, right from the start of treatment, negative biases have been, have been reversed. Uh, but it still takes time for mood to get better, for someone to say, I'm feeling better, I think. Why should that be? And I think what happens is that there's a role of social learning, that though people are in an emotionally transformed world, it's, it, it's an implicit change. You don't feel different. You need to interact with the world at a social and interpersonal level before you realize, actually, these, these emotional responses are different. You meet people, and they seem pleased to see you. So relearning these um, new emotional contingencies takes time, and that's why it, it takes a while for mood to actually improve at a subjective level. Um, I think this also explains a number of things about the antidepressants we use at the moment. That though they're helpful, um, uh, the benefit is rather modest, and that's because they don't affect on they don't work on mood on mood directly, um, but but but, uh, but they change emotion. So you, know, you need to be in a fairly supportive environment before that can be translated in, into feeling better. I think it also explains why antidepressants are not used as recreational agents. They don't cause they don't cause dependence. And that's because, um, unlike a stimulant, for example, they don't affect mood directly. Um, so I, I just wanted to end by saying something about drug discovery. And it's clear the history of psychiatry repurposing has played an important role. Um, so by repurposing, I mean looking at drugs that might be available for other in indications and see whether they could be useful for patients with mental health problems. Um, and in terms of mood disorders, I can, I can discern four main lines of inquiry. Uh, the first is drugs that we know have rather profound effects on mood and consciousness. Guy has mentioned psilocybin, and there's, and there's much interest in um, ketamine, for example, with um, Ruth, Ruth McShane pioneering the use, use of it in the UK to treat patients with treat, treatment refractory depression. I think under the second heading, we're getting rather better at identifying pathophysiological subgroups in mood disorders. 
Certainly some depressed patients appear to have an important inflammatory component to their depression. There are lots of new anti-inflammatory drugs being made to treat people with autoimmune disorders. Might they be helpful if we purpose to some depressed patients? Third, as we've heard, there's a role for big data in making intriguing discoveries. And one concerns more commonly used medical drugs. So for example, statins um, appear to improve the prognosis in patients with bipolar disorder. Um, I just want to say a word about four, which is using repurposing to try to um, mimic an important pharmacological action of drugs which we know are useful but have a low acceptability. And the example I want to give is Epsilon as a lithium mimetic, because this brings us nicely full circle as it involves a, a collaboration between um, pharmacology and psychiatry. Um, so how does lithium work? And that, that's, that's a complex question. Um, one theory is that it works on the phosphoinositol cycle or a PI cycle shown here. So the PI system is a second messenger system which transduces the effects of, of, of neurotransmitters onto the neuron's internal machinery. Um, a key enzyme in the PI system is called inositol monophosphatase, or INPase, and, and as you, you can see, it um, um, regenerates inositol from, from inositol monophosphate. <coughs> Lithium blocks this enzyme, and that's thought to be possibly an important component of its action. If it winds down the PI cycle, this is going to have um, a modifying effect on several aspects of, of, of neurotransmission. Um, drug companies have tried hard to make INPase blockers that enter the brain, but they've not been um, successful. In, in the pharmacology department, um, Nisha Singh and Grant Churchill screened the NIH clinical collection. So these are compounds that are known to be safe to use in, in humans, uh, but have failed their primary clinical trial endpoint. Grant and Nisha found that a drug called Epsilon, which is an antioxidant, which was developed originally uh, for post for post-stroke neuroprotection seemed to be an effective INPase blocker. Um, in animals, um, Epsilon produces a number of, of behavioral effects similar to those, similar to those of lithium. Um, it also lowers brain inositol levels. Um, and that's an important finding uh, because, uh, uh, because it's translatable. Brain inositol can, can be measured in, in humans um, uh, using magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, and here are two studies of the effects of epsilon on brain, brain inositol conducted by Nisha Singh and Charles, and Charles Masaki. At, at therapeutic doses, epsilon does lower brain, brain inositol levels, showing target engagement with the INPAs and enzymes. So this is, this is uh, quite exciting because if lithium does work through INPase blockade, epsilon might be a useful mood stabilizer. Um, epsilon seems safe, it's fairly easy to take, so it, so it might, might be a useful addition to treatment. Um, at, at the moment, uh, we are trying to explore this. Um, by conducting a, a trial in um, bipolar patients um, in, in, the, in, 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 in the manic phase, phase, phase of illness. And so what we're doing is to um, add on either epsilon or, 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 or placebo to standard treatment for three weeks in a um, double-blind randomized design. The primary endpoint is going to be change in ratings on the young mania rating scale. Um, so, so this study is being is being led by by, by my colleagues Anne Sharpley and and, and Claire Williams. Um, these are the young mania rating scales from the first um, 50 patients randomised. 
So you can see the baseline score there, just on under 20, showing a significant degree of symptomatology. And then uh, over the next three, three weeks, epsilon or placebo is added on to treatment as, as, as usual. Uh, we're, we're still blinded, so we, we, we don't know if epsilon is producing any, any specific benefit. Um, but it's good to see that patients overall seem to be doing well, and there's about a 60% response rate by, by week three. Um, I think I should say that I don't think we've been able to conduct this study uh, before the establishment of the um, Biomedical Research Centre and, and, and the help we've had from, from the attached research facilitators, um, as well, of course, the kindness of the patients who've been participants in, 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 in the trial. Um, so I, I think I'll end there. Um, just, just to say that I've been able to mention some, some of the people who played an important role in, in this work, but clearly I've not been able to thank everyone. Um, I wanted to echo what was said yesterday, that uh, this work is, is clearly highly collaborative. And we all know in that situation, we're only as good as the people we work with. And um, I've always felt particularly fortunate that um, I, I've been able to study with the kind of wonderfully accomplished people who are um, drawn, drawn, drawn to work in this great department. Thanks very much.